Looking for magic cards or magic carps? On the new CFB Marketplace you can buy sealed products and singles directly from local game stores. Support the channel by using the referral code LVD at checkout. Hello and welcome to another Historic Brawl game the video. Today we're taking a look at a green-white enchantment saga deck as voted on by my supporters on Patreon, featuring Satsuki the Living Lore as our commander, a 2-mana 1-3 legendary human druid from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, can tap to put a lore counter on each saga we control, can only be used as a sorcery, and then when Satsuki dies, we can either return a target saga or enchantment creature we control to its owner's hand, or return a saga card from our graveyard to our hand instead so it can generate a lot of value and can significantly speed up the process in which our sagas trigger. So to go with Satsuki of course we need plenty of sagas and in fact we're playing every single saga in green and white that is available even if some of them may not be incredibly powerful. So starting out at 2 mana we've got Air of Enlightenment, lets us scry, gain life, eventually turns into a 2-2 two -two first strike. Reign of Truth, one of the better ones, can pump one of our creatures equal to the number of artifacts and enchantments we control, eventually transforming into Portrait of Michiko, which has power and toughness equal to the number of artifacts and enchantments we control. Birth can search up a plains, make an 0-4 wall and gain some life. Triumph can pump up one of our creatures, eventually giving it flying, first strike and lifelink until end of turn. Many journeys can let us play an extra land, gain some life, and turn into a 3-3 creature. Song of Freilies turns all our creatures into mana creatures on the first two chapters, eventually putting a plus one counter on all our creatures, giving them Vigilance, Trample, and Indestructible until end of turn. Teachings makes a 1-1 token, puts a plus one counter somewhere, and turns into a 1-1 creature with a bunch of utility when it attacks. And then Binding of the Titans will mill three cards of each library, exile two cards from graveyards, and eventually get back a creature or land card from our graveyard to our hand. So sometimes it can be beneficial to let Satsuki go to our graveyard instead of the command zone, so we can pick it back up with an effect like Binding, instead of having to pay the commander tax. Then at 3 mana we've got Fall of Lord Konda, which can exile a large creature, eventually transforming into a 1-3 defender that draws a card when it dies. Restoration of Aigancho also searches up a Plains, then we can potentially discard a card to get back a permanent with mana value 2 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped, and eventually turns into a 3-4 Vigilance creature that makes a 1-1 token when it attacks or blocks. History of Benalia is one of the more powerful 3 mana sagas, making a 2-2 Vigilant Knight token on the first two chapters, eventually giving our knights plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. Then Jugan defends the temple, makes a 1-1 mana producing monk on the first chapter, then we get to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each of up to 2 target creatures, and finally transforms into Remnant of the Rising Star, a 2-2 flyer that can sink mana into putting plus 1 plus 1 counters on creatures that entered the battlefield under our control. We've got the Dragon Kami Reborn, one of the more speculative inclusions in the deck, since we don't have an incredibly high creature count, so we might end up missing on the first two chapters, otherwise can gain life and potentially find some sweet creatures to cheat into play. The first arrow in games makes a 1-1 token, distributes 3 plus 1 counters on a creature, then we get to draw a card if we control a large creature, eventually making a gold token which is similar to a treasure token. Battle for Bretagard wants us to have plenty of different tokens, as we get to make a warrior token on chapter 1, an elf warrior on chapter 2, and then we get to double any tokens we control. Then a fall of the imposter adds plus 1 counters on the first two chapters, eventually exiling the opponent's largest creature. Then at 4 mana we've got Befriending the Moths, which can pump one of our creatures giving it flying until end of turn, eventually turning into a 2-4 flyer. Then Boseju reaches Skyward, lets us search up two forests, and eventually it turns into Branch of Boseju, which has reach and power and toughness equal to the number of lanes we control. Then at 5 mana, Elspeth Conquers Death, one of the more powerful sagas that can exile an opposing permanent with mana value 3 or greater, then on chapter 2 makes their non-creature spells more expensive, and eventually gets back a creature or planeswalker from our graveyard to the battlefield with an extra plus 1 counter or loyalty counter. Tales of Master Seshiro gets to distribute some counters and give Vigilance until end of turn, and finally turns into a 5-5 creature with Vigilance and Haste. And then we've got Mending of Dominaria, which will mill two cards and get back a creature from our graveyard to our hand on the first two chapters, eventually getting back all lands from our graveyard to the battlefield as well. And then Fall of the Thran is not incredibly synergistic in our deck, but can cause some chaos, first destroying all lands, and then slowly getting two lands back from graveyards to the battlefield. 
Then taking a look at the author cards in our deck, we've got them sorted into a few different categories, starting out with removal, where we have source to plowshares, Kenris transformation, very effective when played on the opponent's commander, as it will shut down any abilities, we've got banishing light, borrowed time, touch the spirit realm, and cast out as more exile based removal, and Calyx Destiny's Hand can provide card advantage with the plus one, or be used as removal with a minus three. Then the next category is Mana Acceleration, where we have Lenor Elves at 1 mana, Starfield Mystic and Jukai Naturalist can discount our enchantments, we've got a Nessian Wanderer finding additional lands with Constellation, Sanctum Weaver one of the more powerful ramp options, tapping for mana equal to the number of enchantments we control, Wolf Willow Haven can enchant one of our lands, letting it produce additional green mana, we've got Arcane Signet, Cultivate and then Mirari's Wake, doubling the mana that our lands produce and giving our creatures plus one plus one. Then the next category are card draw effects or card filtering effects, starting out with Commune with Spirits, letting us look at the top four to reveal an enchantment or land to put into our hand, Spirited Companion, a 1-1 enchantment creature that draws a card, Broadback has pretty good synergy with some of our sagas, as a 2 mana instant lets us choose up to 2 target permanent cards in our graveyard that were put there from the battlefield this turn, and then we get to return them to the battlefield tapped, so some of our sagas eventually end up in our graveyard, which we can then bring back with Broadback maybe alongside something else, also great if the opponent plays a sweeper to just get back a few creatures at once, and in general just a nice value card. Then Rite of Harmony also has good synergy with the new enchantments from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, which eventually transform into enchantment creatures, because this is an instant saying whenever a creature or enchantment enters the battlefield under our control this turn, we get to draw a card, and because it's an instant we can potentially cast it in response to one of our sagas transforming, so we can draw additional cards right away and potentially play more creatures and enchantments afterwards, also has a flashback for 4 mana. Then Sithis, one of the more powerful card draw engines, as a 1-2 legendary enchantment creature that gains a life and draws a card whenever we cast an enchantment. Enchantress's Presence, a 3-mana enchantment that draws a card when we cast an enchantment. Same with Seder Enchanter on a 2-2 creature. And then Satessan Champion triggers Constellation whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under our control, putting a plus one plus one counter on it and drawing a card. So also great synergy with the new sagas from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. And then we've got a Brilliant Restoration, a 7 mana sorcery, returning all artifact and enchantment cards from our graveyard to the battlefield. So a great card in any grindy matchup where lots of cards end up in the graveyard. Then the next category is additional utility cards, including Alsaid of Life's Bounty, which can protect one of our creatures or enchantments. We've got Curse of Silence, which can name the opponent's commander to make it too more expensive. Then we can always sacrifice it to draw a card. Destiny Spinner makes our enchantments uncounterable, can also turn our lands into large creatures. We've got Weaver of Harmony, a 2-2 enchantment creature that gives other enchantment creatures we control plus one plus one, can pay a green mana and tap it to copy target activated or triggered ability we control from an enchantment source and choose new targets for the copy, so it plays very well with our sagas, which we can potentially double up, and also plays well with our removal spells like Banishing Light, Borrow Time, so we can potentially exile two things, also can potentially double our card draw effects, so we can draw multiple cards, so it has a ton of synergy throughout the deck. Then Sterling Grove will protect our enchantments, giving them Shroud. Can also be sacrificed to tutor up an enchantment and put it on top of our deck. Then Catilda has Flying, a lifelink and protection from vampires, and becomes larger the more enchantments we control. Can also be disturbed out of our graveyard in the form of an aura with the same abilities. And then Arasta, a 3-5 a legendary enchantment creature spider with reach, that generates 1-2 green spider creature tokens with reach whenever the opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell. And then the final category are cards that trigger whenever we cast an enchantment, including Generous Visitor, which can put a plus one counter anywhere, Kami of Transience can come back from our graveyard to our hand whenever an enchantment leaves the battlefield, and then picks up plus one plus one counters whenever we cast an enchantment spell on a 2-2 Trampler. We've got Teshar, a 2-2 Flyer that can return a creature with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield whenever we cast a Historic spell, which includes Sagas as well. We've got Archon of Sun's Grace, a 3-4 flying lifelink that gives other Pegasus creatures we control a lifelink as well, and with Constellation it generates 2-2 flying Pegasus tokens. And then Hello Taunting generates spirit tokens with power and toughness equal to the number of spirits we control whenever we cast an enchantment spell, and finally gives all our creatures flying and vigilance as long as we control 7 or more enchantments. And then last but not least, Sigil of the Empty Throne, generating 4-4 flying angel tokens whenever we cast an enchantment. 
And then the mana base is pretty straightforward, a few utility lands including Castle Ardenvale, the new channel lands from Kamigawa, not too many creature lands since we have other ways to spend our mana, and then a Karn's Bastion can potentially proliferate to add additional plus one counters to our creatures, as well as additional lore counters to our sagas as well, similar to Satsuki. So yeah, that's our deck, now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Alright, we're on the play, facing Feather the Redeemed, so it can be a pretty tough matchup. What do we think of this hand? It's a little clunky with the two tap lands, but I do like some of our sagas in the matchup, and then Calyx for interaction, so we could try it. Ooh, a liner elves a turn late, but could still play it alongside a tapped guild gate, perhaps. Because I do want double white for history as soon as possible. But now we could also play Calyx if we prefer. Alright. So four mana. Yeah, going for Calyx and then plussing makes sense. And then next turn we can maybe double spell. Or I could go Kami plus Satsuki. And then next turn trigger history twice. That's also reasonable. Let's see if they already run out their commander here. Feather plus Comatrix, a powerful combo. It's gonna be a justice strike taking out Rokami. Okay, so I've got five mana. Could go for Calyx and plus, or we could play History, although then we waste two mana, which is not ideal. I guess we can go for Calyx, keep up white mana in case we find a white one drop with a plus. And Mending and Transformation. Transformation is not a bad answer to Feather, so we'll pick that up. And then Satsuki plays Defense. Although Combat Trick on Clarion Spirit still gets past our 1 3. So we'll have to tread carefully. There's Feather. And Ryle draws a card, triggers Clarion Spirit. And they might still have a protection spell here. This is naming White. I think I'm okay blocking. If they play Pump Spell to kill Satsuki, then their shield's down on Feather and we can transformation it. Uh, Regent's Authority it is. Tears at reality. And then we'll move it to the Command Zone. Naturalist could be useful. So let's see. Might be a little short on white mana. Although I can still go Naturalists, Transformation plus History, I guess that's good enough. And then we could also use Calyx as minus. Although we would have to target one of our enchantments and none of them are necessarily all that permanent. If our opponent has something like God's Willing, giving protection from green, Transformation would still fall off. I guess we'll start here with Naturalist into Transformation, see what we draw off the Transformation before we decide what to do next. All right, Air of Enlightenment. I wouldn't be able to play alongside History. So I guess we'll plus with Calyx for now. Finding a Sigil. Seems better than the Alsaid. And then History of Banalia. It's probably okay. Pass it back. And then next turn we can try and trigger the Sigil right away. Legionnaire, also a nice recipient of those combo tricks. So wouldn't be able to keep Calyx in play for long. A 
sends everyone at Calyx. Probably fine to let him go. Yeah, blocking is not going to work out well for us. Alright, opponent's got a fateful absence for naturalists. Calyx down. Destiny draws me elsewhere. And Kami returns to hand. Land is good. So now I can play Sigil and trigger it with Era to make an Angel right away. And then do I want additional lands? Probably not necessary at this point. And then probably fine to trade a Knight for a combo trick here as it makes it more likely that our 4 for Angel can block profitably. Opponent takes two. And then we want to take the damage from Feather since we don't want our opponent to get it back. Okay, maybe put my Angel in front of Clarion Spirits, requiring more than just a pump spell, and then take the rest. Double blocking Legionnaire probably doesn't work out all that well. So yeah, I'll take it. That's going to be a somewhat sprint on Legionnaire, so they're giving up on the Clarion Spirit perhaps. But getting in a nice chunk of damage. One unknown card left in hand. Authority will force a trade. Alright, so we're 13, but... Got some nice engines in play now. And, uh, yeah, opponent has seen enough. They know about our Kami in hand. Any enchantments we play generate additional 4 4 angels, and that's just too much for them to overcome. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play, and we're missing a second land. Birth can find one, but probably can't keep this. Take our free mulligan. Okay, another somewhat sketchy hand missing green mana. But uh, companion gets to draw, get to play Alsaid early. So it's maybe not the worst. And then early creatures, also good combo with Song of Freilies, turning them into mana creatures. So then a single green source all of a sudden gives us a lot of green mana. And then I think I'm okay playing Alsaid turn one because of the Song of Freilies. Although Enchantress's presence kind of incentivizes us to hold some of our cheaper enchantments to draw a card. Alright, there's our forest, so... Next turn I could go Song of Freilies into, let's say, Enchantress's presence. Or we could play Presence first, because otherwise we're out of enchantments to trigger our card draw effect. Seems fine. Pass it back. And then next turn we can hopefully string together some card draw. Opponent plays Catilda. Three humans make mana. Vigilance also nice combo with it. Faceless Agent can find a human. So step one, Song of Freilies draw card. All right, Reign of Truth is not bad. So, let's say play Reign of Truth. Can play a Lenor Elves as well, but we'll see what we draw first. Banishing Lights, okay. So, probably fine to hit for six, play an Elf, and then next turn Banishing Light maybe deals with Catilda. And then Restoration's also looking good with a few Sagas that might end up in the graveyard. Bretagar Protector generates tokens with Landfall. Pretty strong too. Take six. And Arcane Signet, the follow-up. Okay. 
So probably targeting the lifelinker still. And then we've got quite a few options, including maybe starting with birth, see what we draw. So the Alsaid likely wants to attack. Question is what to exile with Banishing Light, whether it's Cotilda or the Bretagard Protector at this point. Yeah, I mean, Cotilda's a good mana sink, but they can always replay it from the command zone, so it feels better to get rid of the Protector. But I can uh, attack first. Maybe they jump, which is fine by me. Play Banishing Light, and then most likely play Satsuki as well. Okay. And then we're okay if some of our enchantments die, since we can get them back with Restoration. Next turn, Song of Freilies. Gonna pump our team and allow for a free attack, basically. Torrents can also generate 1-1 one, one tokens. And then we have to be a little careful here. Let's see, 3, 4, 5, 6. So they can pump with Katilda, so don't want to block with Satsuki. Just going for 2 damage. And our opponent keeps up Katilda's ability, so they can maybe block and then pump their team. Sithis, also a great draw here. Always have the Alsei to potentially protect one of our creatures. And also good synergy with Restoration. But let's start with Sithis, see what we draw off Presence. Maybe pick up another Saga. Alright, and our opponent scoops it up. Too many card draw engines between Sithis and Presence here. On to the next one. All right, we're on the draw, facing Risona, a Sari commander. It's an aggressive red-white deck. We've got a keeper. Turn to Sanctum Weaver can lead to some good things. And then we've got a bit of interaction. One powerful Saga to combo with Satsuki. And Weaver could also combo with Cast Out to exile two things. Turn to Black Blade or Forge, their opponent's serious about equipping their commander. Well, play Weaver, and then if they play their commander, we get to untap with our powerful 2-drop. So Risona indestructible now. Opponent might be playing some sweepers in their deck as well to combo with the commander. Would not be too surprising for now. Kind of digging Enchantress's presence into Weaver of Harmony, draw card. And then Weaver could maybe combo with Cast Out next turn. And exiling Risona gets around Indestructible. And generally speaking, exiling the opponent's commander is a pretty safe way to play these removal spells because the opponent's likely to put their commander back in the command zone. So even if they destroy Cast Out, they wouldn't be getting anything back. Unless, of course, we exile two things at once, in which case it's slightly different again. Opponent equips Risona, hits us for 7, we'll take it. Okay, we've got a lot of options now. So, the simple play here would be cast out copy with Weaver, and then I would still have some mana left. Yeah, that's probably good enough, so let's go full control just in case. Cast out, trigger presence. But we're going to double the cast-out trigger as opposed to the presence trigger here. So go after Risona. And then double cast-out with Weaver. Floating some additional green mana. And get rid of the Black Blade as well. Alright, and that's enough to prompt a concession. So great start from the enchantment deck. On to the next one. Alright, we're on the play, facing Satoru Umezawa, 
So an interesting ninjutsu deck potentially. And yeah, looks like we have a keeper. Turn two, probably go for Arcane Signet, and then turn three, we can double spell. Opponents with some cheap evasive creatures to combo with Ninjutsu, of course. I guess we could also go for many journeys now. Play the tap land, and then Signet can tap for mana the turn we play it. That's probably better. So next turn I can go Signet into a 3-drop potentially, although most likely gonna go for Satsuki. And then Conqueror's Death could exile Umezawa. Yeah, I think I'm still fine going for Satsuki here. Opponent could have a Wash Away to counter it. Maybe a 1-mana Bounce spell. Yeah, Fading Hope, fair enough. So if I put this in my hand and they make us discard it, I can still send it to the command zone. So hand is fine. Opponent might have some other ninjutsu creatures in their deck as well. Or they might be trying to cheat some expensive things into play with Umezawa. But yeah, there's a cheaper ninjutsu creature, makes sense. Also makes... Satoru's ability one cheaper. Okay, so don't want to conquer his death just yet, but we can play a bunch of other things out. Maybe Kami into Satsuki and then next turn teachings. As the tree line comes into play tapped. Possible opponents uses the Pilfering Imp before playing their commander to check for removal. Nope, there's Satoru. Take two. And yeah, going for Conqueror's Death seems safe here. And hope there's no Spell Pierce or... Alright, opponent's got the Spell Pierce. Okay, so their opponent will be able to use a ninjutsu from Satoru, so if they have an expensive creature in hand, they can cheat it into play. Can still maybe get Conqueror's Death back if Satsuki dies. Opponent draws two. And we'll see if there's ninjutsu happening. Ornithopter, another great enabler. And Pilfering Imp has a look. Probably makes us discard our own games. And Storm Tamer the play. Alright, so not a whole lot of ninjutsu happening right now. Can play Teachings. Make a large Kami of Transients. And uh, start attacking. Opponent takes five, and I guess we'll keep land in hand for now. Take two. Tails, nice draw. And then maybe put two counters on the likeness. Attack for 11. Might see a chum block. And so kind of our fair game plan of just playing some powerful sagas seems to be working out. And... Won't be able to take out both here. Probably fine taking out Silverfur Master, since it could easily replay Satoru. And then we get to untap some lands, not that it matters. At this point our opponent has enough mana to cast whatever they would cheat into play with Satoru, so I'm not too concerned. 
If they kill Satsuki, we maybe return Conqueror's death to our hands, who knows. Alright, looks like our opponent has given up, so yeah, just a nice fair game plan. Opponent never got to cheat anything scary into play, and we got there, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw, facing Ugin, the ineffable, a very scary, colorless ramp deck. Although Banishing Light is a nice one to have access to, we've got a very explosive draw with lots of mana acceleration, could use some more card draw and some curve toppers, but I guess we'll try it. Turn 1 Ladder Elves, always powerful. Possible that our opponent is more of a low curve artifact deck, as opposed to trying to ramp into big Eldrazi. Take one. And then many journeys, plus Starfield Mystic. Seems like a good sequence. And yeah, just waiting for those expensive spells now. Caravan, they won't be able to crew just yet. Alright, Katilda's a good draw. So, Katilda plus Satsuki. And then see if there's a target for Banishing Light next turn. Although we might want to keep it for Ugin. Lithoform Engine. Could be quite scary as well. Problem with playing Banishing Light before they play Ugin is that they can just destroy the Banishing Light and get their engine back. So that doesn't seem incredibly productive. Restoration, still a good play here. And then... Probably no need to swords anything. Can use Satsuki again to just put the planes in play, but we haven't played land for the turn, so I guess it doesn't accomplish much. But speeding up the restoration might still be worth it. Let's see. Can attack with Katilda. That's probably it. And then I guess we'll speed this up. Pass it back. Keep swords available. And maybe Banishing Light Ugin. Opponent does get to play basics of another color because there's no wastes in Arena. Hope of Girapur. Played for free thanks to the two mana discount. And we'll see if Ugin pluses or minuses. Goes up. Yeah, I think the plan's just to untap Banishing Light Ugin and keep trucking. Ooh, nice. Enchantress's Presence. Great draw. Katilda also getting bigger and bigger. And we can hit for five, I guess. Anything else want to attack? Not really. Bone does have an Inventor's Fair that could search up an artifact at some point as well. And an arch that can draw. They have the city's blessing. So, game's far from over. They can also replay Ugin with an extra mana. Lithoform engine can also copy all sorts of things. We'll untap, Kami the draw. So, let's get in there with probably Architects. Likeness and Katilda. Suppose Starfield Mystic could attack too and potentially trade for their 2 2. Don't think I want to swords anything.
And yeah, this is a spirit token, so it also grows Catilda. So nice synergy there too. Opponent goes for the double block. Still don't think I want a swords. Opponent falls to eights. Play Kami and pass it back. I guess this is also Spirit, so might have wanted to play its pre mods to grow Catilda one more. Inventor's Fair, gonna search up an artifact. Copied by a Lithoform engine, that's nice. So they get to search up two things. Maybe set up some combo with uh, Paradox engine, who knows. Gets a meter golem for removal. And they forsake a monument to generate extra mana. So what's it gonna be? They don't have enough mana to copy the meter golem trigger with engine, which is maybe their goal, so they might set up their mana with forsaken monuments. Still three mana remaining for Bankbuster, gains two. Probably one or two swords the hope in response to Forsaken Monuments, because now they would gain more life. But I think we still go for it, opponent goes up to 14, and then they have a blocker. Let's see, they can't crew the Caravan or the Bankbuster necessarily. Alright, so I can attack with a team. And hopefully this is enough. Alright, sweet, so luckily didn't get punished for missing out on a few points earlier. On to the next one. All right, we're on the draw, facing Kyodai, five-color deck potentially, and yeah, we've got a keepable hand. Some mana acceleration with Signets, card draw with Champion. And we'll see what our opponent is up to. Sterling Grove, all right, so points towards a five-color enchantment deck. I have to play Boseju as a land, even though it would be a potential answer to Sterling Grove. Yeah, Sanctum of Fruitful Harvest, a powerful early play. Probably have to cultivate to keep hitting my land drops, and then next turn we can try to double spell. Might actually want to grab more white mana because of uh, Brilliant Restoration. And then next turn I could Champion plus Companion. I want to try and draw into an answer for Sterling Grove so we can Conquer's Death. One of their scarier Sanctums, opponent with a white one, generating 1-1 tokens. So yeah, Champion into Companion looks okay. And then Sterling Grove could at some point get their 5 mana Sanctum. That finds the other shrines. So that could be scary. But if they do sacrifice Sterling Grove, then we could Conquer's Death. Their enchantments once again. Okay, so we've got 6 mana at our disposal. 
Going for Fall of the Thren is probably not a great idea here, since their opponent has mana discounts from Naturalist and their Fruitful Harvest generating more mana. So how about... can play a Weaver. Maybe play Satsuki this turn, or Weaver plus Arasta. Could go for Tails as well. Gonna have a hard time attacking on the ground. So... Yeah, I guess going for Tails is fine. Or I could go Satsuki plus a Dragon Kami Reborn, just to get Satsuki in play. Finding Seder Enchanter. Hallowed Haunting could be great. And let's see, probably don't have any great attacks. Yeah, it doesn't seem worth it. Signet for more mana. Opponent could pump up their Soul of Kamigawa. It's gonna be a Lightning Bolt on Weaver. So no doubling of triggers. And our opponent does pump to hit us for eight. So for now they seem reluctant to sacrifice Turling Grove. Find, I guess, a land since I don't want to put this in exile. Okay, next up. Could still go for Fall of the Thran, play my lands afterwards to get a little bit of value. And then Satsuki can get lands back at an increased speed, but of course that also lets the opponent get their lands back. Probably just want to get the Hallowed Haunting going. Arrow of Enlightenment's not bad. And uh, can activate Satsuki afterwards too. Scribe before drawing, Sigil, good draw. Champion triggers again, and then don't have anything to do for two mana, so we'll play our tap land. And now I can probably afford to attack. Opponent's just gonna jump with a 1 1, that's okay. And if they attack on the ground, I can jump with the egg to uh, get my Seder Enchanter. Their opponent just attacking with her flyer. Mirari's Wake, I guess another reason to fire off Fall of the Thran. Luckily not enough mana to pump twice. Alright, so we've got lots of things going on here. How much mana? 7, 8, 9 potentially. I would really like to get Sigil in play before blowing up all lands. Maybe Visitor first. Putting the counter on maybe the Spirit Token, which will eventually fly. Currently have one, two, three, four, five enchantments. So we're getting close to having enough to give the team flying. Cast out could be an answer to Sterling Grove. And then we can Conquer's Death, so I think that's going to be the plan now. Activate Satsuki. And uh, 
Yeah, can attack. Spirit token can get in there too. And then next turn we can double spell, maybe cast out the Sterling Grove, followed by Conqueror's Death. Although if we cast out Sterling Grove, they would likely sacrifice it to search up their Sanctum. Kyodai gonna pump a few times, can always jump with her Angel. So that's 14 power. Could have used Conqueror's Death on Kyodai a while ago, but didn't seem all that important. So, do we feel the need to chump? Not really. Opponent gets to make a couple blockers end of turn, but our team's gonna gain flying, so... Alright, let's untap, maybe fetch first. Champion triggers once again. Champion definitely carried us in this game. And then, uh, let's see here, maybe Harasta. Some more counters, doesn't matter. Team gains flying. And then we should have enough for lethal here, but can play cast out too if we want. Alright, sweet, on to the next one. All right, we're on the draw, facing Omnath Locus of the Royal, so a Teamer Elementals deck. Got a keepable hand. Hopefully get a Mirari's Wake in play soon to double our mana. Got a couple Sagas to go with Satsuki. And then turn two we can decide between Satsuki or Birth. Into this open mana, probably want to play birth firsts. Could simply curve into Fall of the Imposter as well, although probably want to wait for a creature that actually makes use of those counters more than a wall. Spirited Companion could work. So we could go for Companion, could go for Satsuki. Yeah, I guess Satsuki is okay here. And I'm not too upset if this gets countered or removed. A braid. That's fine. And command zone is acceptable. Even though Conqueror's Death could eventually get it back. And then sure, why not pick up a Saga? Even though I have to discard to hand size now. Can discard... Forest maybe... Opponent missing green mana for Omnath. Can replay Birth, play Companion too. And then next turn maybe resolve a Mirari's Wake. That would be ideal. Opponent going for chemisters to try and find their green mana, which they found. But now we get to resolve Mirari's Wake, and hopefully it doesn't get removed next turn. Attack for two. And now with more mana, it's going to be easier to empty our hands, replay Satsuki as well. Bounty for card draw, and our opponent explodes. Yeah, letting your opponent untap with Mirari's Wake 
is not a good feeling, so it's understandable. On to the next one. All right, we're on the draw. We've got a promising hand if Sanctum Weaver survives. Although facing Kaikar, that's not a given. And then our hands probably falls apart once we lose Sanctum Weaver. Still give it a shot. We do have an answer to Kaikar at least. And grab a planes since we need double white. Faithful Mending in main phase to draw and discard. So we'll get to resolve Sanctum Weaver. Question remains whether we'll get to untap with it. So it doesn't champion another excellent draw. Snarl coming into play untapped. That's a very rare sight. So if they kill Sanctum Weaver, maybe Satessan Champion survives. It's going to be a Crystal into Spell Bomb. Okay. Could also play Archon of Sun's Grace instead. And then next turn, maybe go Satessan Champion into a cheap enchantment. Although currently don't have one of those. Playing Dragon Kami Reborn feels kind of weak. Wouldn't leave enough mana to play Satsuki afterwards. So Archon is maybe the play here. And if they want to bounce it with a Spell Bomb, that works for me. Mythos of Vadrok kills Archon. At least we still have our Sanctum Weaver, and Calyx, not a bad draw either. So Calyx, probably the play here. And yeah, I guess Sanctum Weaver had its abilities shut down by Mythos as well, so it couldn't tap for mana. Weaver and Destiny Spinner. Spinner... Good against counter spells, which our opponent may very well have. And they're both two mana enchantment creatures, so yeah, spinner seems fine. Nice follow-up to maybe a Satessan champion. We'll be able to source in the opponent's turn once Weaver regains its ability. Opponent just drawing a card with a spell bomb. Is it time for a Kaikar? It is. So we'll Swords it first chance we get, pretty much. And then next turn we can go Champion plus maybe a Destiny Spinner. Birth also a good follow-up to ensure that we hit our land drops. And then I'll probably end up plussing Calyx once again. And Sith is an excellent pickup. Even though our spider would be quite good in this matchup, as our opponent's playing plenty of instants and sorceries. Kaikar enters the battlefield once again, although we can maybe exile it with Calyx. Just have to choose an enchantment carefully that won't leave the battlefield anytime soon. Borrow time, also an excellent answer. So yeah, we're going off now. Can play Sithis. Borrow time. Get rid of Kaikar probably. And then I could also decide to keep a broad back in case of a sweeper. Excellent 
and Kaikar going back to the command zone makes her borrow time less of a liability. And Kallax can plus Finding Binding. So do we want to keep a broad back or do we want to play more stuff out? Currently can make four mana with Weaver. Yeah, I guess we'll play it safe here. We're enough ahead that that seems prudent. Although I guess her opponent does have a Lantern. So that would prevent us from actually getting anything back if they have the mana for both. Alright, I guess that's a reason to still play stuff out. And uh, can go for Companion. And a Triumph. Alright, let's discard to hand size. Guildgate can go. And maybe like a Binding. Planes. Looks okay. Do we see a sweeper? Is not right. Yep, time wipe. Alright, well, we wanted to play around it, but Lantern prevented that from being effective. I guess Lantern being in play also reason to just discard the Broadback. Although they might just uh, cycle it at some point. Okay, Tashar still a good way to get some creatures back. So we can start there. Tashar plus many journeys, maybe. Get back Sadassan Champion. So it can trigger right away. And our opponent's gonna force the issue on Lantern. Okay, keep plussing. Hallowed Haunting looks good, Conqueror's Death also nice. Hmm, I guess Mending also has its benefits here, as it can maybe fuel the graveyard for Tashar, but I'll go with the Haunting. Ooh, Mirari's Wake. Don't mind if I do. So we can wake four mana left, which is enough for Hello Taunting. And Kalex could minus here on Kaikar, putting it on the borrow time. Hit for three. Now Kaikar is prohibitively expensive at 10 mana. Although I guess they have just enough to replay it. And our opponent has seen enough. So yeah, the opponent's Graveyard 8 managed to counter our Broadback, otherwise we would have been able to play around their Sweeper quite nicely. And also good to see the importance of having a card draw engine in play, which keeps fueling our deck. So overall, a deck that doesn't rely too much on its commander can easily win games without it, but of course with all the sagas still has good synergy with it and prevents us from playing against too many high tier decks, as opposed to including something like Sithis as our commander, which would arguably be much more powerful. So that'll do it for today's gameplay, wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day! I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.